July test, team of the week for the third and final week, folks. We're going to go through 15 guys, pick a team of the week, talk about some uh, top performers, some stats and moments, and um, perhaps some uh, unlucky guys that I've not picked as well, honorable mentions, and um, yeah, you guys can let me know your thoughts as always. If you fancy yourself a purple Irish jersey, or a Rugby World Cup winning jersey from the 2019 Springboks campaign, check out Level Rugby. Link in the description, folks. i um, gotten a bunch of gear from them in the past. They're an affiliate of the channel now. Heaps of rugby gear. Um, check them out. They've also had Samoa jerseys on uh, on special as well. Um, I'm going to start in a little bit of a kind of alternative order with this one because the first name I really want to put on the board is, uh, is a lock. And uh, that one would be Tyg Burt. Just because that was such a performance from that guy. It was almost unbelievable. Like some of the stuff that guy did was just phenomenal. Like very rarely will you see a guy put in quite a shift as much as it does turnovers galore. I know he's good at turnovers, but even for him. I think that was some uh, some pretty outstanding stuff. Statistically, he's credited with four turnovers, um, at least two, three of them in the end of the game, right? He basically single-handedly, uh, well, not single-handedly, it's a team game, but he snuffed out the All Blacks' attempts to try and get themselves back into the game, didn't he? Uh, he wins the lineout. He has five runs for 20 meters, including a clean break, which I'm assuming is the intercept pass he picks off from Aaron Smith. Read that one like an absolute book. You'd think him and Smith are on the same team the way he knew it was coming. Um, he has four passes. He's got 16 from 17 tackles. Doesn't manage to concede any penalties, despite the fact that he's stealing All Blacks ball like mad. You're usually putting yourself into a kind of high-risk category for penalties conceded when you do that. Um, what doesn't he do, man? I mean, you notice when there's the Rob Herring try, the mall try, he's part of that mall. And he essentially removes two All Blacks defenders from that mall when they kind of peel off. He peels off, and I think it's Akira Iwani and Sam Whitelock. So Ireland lose one from the mall. The All Blacks lose two. Just like his impact on the game in every facet was just phenomenal. He does have two turnovers conceded, so maybe knock-ons. I don't remember. But um, either way, that was a pretty bloody classy shift from Tyke Byrne. Yeah, absolute, absolute monster of a performance. Um, back to the more kind of regular order. Props. Uh, I'm going to put one of the Argentinian boys in here. And if you guys know me, I, I, I sometimes try to reward the props that just put their heads down and do a bit of set piece. And sometimes the guys who were just doing uh, a bit of the crazy stuff around the park. He has four runs for eight meters, which for a prop is actually pretty effective ball carrying. He's chewing over two meters of carry instead of the kind of more standard one. He beats a couple of defenders. He makes 12 from 12 tackles, which is, um, you know, second only to Tyke Furlong in terms of a prop making tackles this week. And he played about 20 minutes less uh, than Big Tyke. And Tyke, I don't think, really had saw the ball much, but um, Gajo was getting his hands on the pill. He also doesn't concede any penalties. And to be fair, when his replacement comes on, they do concede a couple of scrum penalties on that loose head side. So I think Gajo propping the scrum as well was actually putting in a pretty good shift he does have two turnovers conceded but ultimately uh the youngster i thought um i thought did pretty well for the uh for the argentinians uh tight head i'm actually going to go with one of the replacement guys for the spring box in uh vincent cock i thought he i mean he replaces mal herber who's pretty much like not quite exclusively a scrummager but largely, he's, he's there for his set piece, isn't he? Like, you don't really pick uh, Mal Herber for his round-the-park stuff. But that's the primary job of a prop is scrummaging and, you know, lifting guys and, uh, you know, breakdown work. So that's not it's not the end of the world. If you could pick a prop who's fantastic around-the-park or fantastic scrummager, you're probably better off going with the scrummager uh, personally. But Vincent Cock, he's got a bit of both. And uh, six carries from him when he comes on early in the second half. 13 meters like Gajo a kind of relatively uh, dynamic ball carrier for a prop. He beats a defender. He has a pass. He makes three from four tackles. And um, ultimately, I've kind of picked him because you got to give some credit to the uh, the Welsh, not Welsh, the uh, the Springboks Ford pack for kind of dominating the Welsh. This is the one game 
where we really saw just the physical dominance of the Springboks pack. So uh, I think Vincent Koch is a pretty exemplary guy to uh, to represent what they were doing up front. Uh, Hooker may be a slightly controversial one because admittedly uh, the lineup for the Scots was not phenomenal. But uh, Ewan Ashman... He scores a couple of tries, and I do like me a try scoring front rower. He gets one from the mall, which starts from a liner, obviously, so they got that one right. And uh, he gets one kind of out on the wing where, um, I forget, is it Kinghorn that chucks from the ball? And it's just like, go, go for the corner. And uh, he flattens Delhi, the winger, with the kind of wee winger, not the biggest winger. And uh, Ashman basically destroys him on the way to the goal line. But um, yeah, not that often. Your hooker gets two tries that aren't kind of both mall tries, so... Uh, good for him to to get out on the wing and convert for the front row club. Um, he has two tries, like I mentioned. Seven runs for 12 metres. Also, fairly decent ball-carrying numbers. Hookers are usually a bit above props, but um, they're not usually at the same level of Lucy. So, solid stuff. Beats a defender, which will be Delhi. Has a pass. 10 from 10 tackles, so proper defensive shift. The only negative factor, I think, for the Scottish hooker in that game was the line-out, which, um, like, there was a chance right before halftime, another five-meter line-out, which he threw in, which got pinched by Petty, but I think it was Petty. But, um, yeah, other than that, I think uh, Ashman, ball-carrying, defensive shift, gets his tries, um, puts in a pretty tight one. Other guys who you could consider, Xander Fagerson, like I mentioned, gave the replacement loose head uh, all kinds of trouble for the Scots. Uh, Alice Gend was pretty busy for the English. Um, hookers? I mean, Dan Sheehan was obviously pretty good for the Irish. But, uh, yeah, I mean, fine, I got one for the Aussies as well in terms of tries. But, yeah, there you go. Uh, other lock, I have gone with another Springbok. It was his 100th game, and he did get man of the match. Someone mentioned in the comments that may have been a little bit sentimental. They might be right. I'm not sure if he was man of the match, but he's certainly always a big physical presence is Big Eben. Uh, I think his discipline was a bit better this week as well. He conceded a couple of penalties, as people rightly pointed out last week, towards the tail end of the game, which were maybe a bit costly. But, um, like, big carries. Big carry before the Mapimpi non-try. Like, he carries into contact, and then the Welsh end up giving away a penalty from that tackle on him. And then uh, the box go wide, Mapimpi foot and touch. But they still conceded a penalty, just bringing the big man down or trying to turn him over or whatever. I think it was Rollins. But um, yeah, so big carry, but still earns his team three points, kind of as a as a part of a team effort. There, um, he carries eight times. He puts in a couple of passes. He beats a defender. He makes six from six tackles. And in the scheme of things, you might be like six tackles. Like you see, guys get twenty tackles in huge shifts. But the box only made like eighty eight tackles. Most teams are usually easily above a hundred. So six tackles in the scheme of things was one of the higher tacklers for the Springboks, and he's certainly at 100%. Um, wins three lineouts as well. It was mostly Diaka at lineout time, but uh, Etzebeth also did his bit there as well. So that's your type five. Like I mentioned, Petty also for the Argentinians was pretty good. Diaka, probably the king of the air this week. Uh, Hill for England was also really solid, but there you go. There's your type five. I forgot to mention this at the start of the video. I always do these videos. It's mostly a bit of fun. It's a bit of banter, and uh, just to highlight some guys I thought did well. Sometimes I get comments about I know, people taking it a bit too seriously. I hope you guys find it fun and uh, can suggest your own guys as well. That, that's that's kind of the meaning behind it. So if I haven't picked anyone that um, was a particular standout, then uh, do let us know friendlily in the comments. Um, Lucy's. Lucy's was the trickiest one to pick because there's genuinely a lot of guys who stood out and I'm definitely going to miss out some of the proper standouts, but... Courtney Laws for England, I do think he was phenomenal as well. Uh, he's been good all tour, to be fair. He's been captain, and he's not let that take away from his game. He's another one who has a big carry right before his team gets points. Like, it's a breath. He's got a big carry right before the steward try, before half time. So, good carrying into contact, getting his team over the advantage line. He ends up with five carries in the game. Eight meters for a Lucy is not phenomenal, but he's kind of that lock Lucy, so it's maybe to be expected, but... Big carries over the advantage line when needed. Beats a defender. Four passes. 14 out of 15 tackles is a shift. And he's a key part in that defensive shift of the English to hold the Aussies out in that second half when they were just under the pump. Five line-out wins. Good in the air. Four turnovers won. 
just like just like Tyke Burton. I forget how many of his are in the air and how many of them kind of ruck and tackle, but certainly responsible for pinching a fair bit of Aussie ball. Does have one uh, turnover conceded himself and does have one penalty conceded, but overall I thought the big man was was uh, was pretty immense. So it's going to be an interesting one going forward to see if he remains captain or not. Uh, open side was genuinely the hardest one, I think, to pick, and I've definitely... Uh, had to kind of make a call on like Khaleesi's big ball carrying game or Van der Fleer's like just defensive shift plus a try. So uh, I ended up going with Khaleesi. Um, sometimes I'll just go with a guy who makes a million tackles, which would have been Van der Fleer. But I mean, Khaleesi, he powers over for his try. And at the time when I watched it, I thought it was a pretty big gap that he'd gone into. Like not a huge like Red Sea gap, but like at least a space and then he kind of forced his way through it. I'm watching it again. It was slightly smaller than I remember. So I give him a bit even more credit for for making the most of that kind of half gap. Not even really much of a gap. But he powers through between two Welsh defenders. So he scores that try. Uh, six runs for 41 metres is a heck of a return. Uh, he's got a clean break. He's got a defender beaten. A couple of passes. Again, six tackles. But in the scheme of things, I mean, Van der Fleer was like 20-something crazy. But um, in the scheme of the Springboks shift, six was one of the higher numbers. He also wins a turnover. He does have one turnover conceded and a couple of missed tackles. But overall, I think the Springboks really enjoyed seeing that guy take the ball to the line and get their team going forward because uh, Khaleesi is that kind of mixed player where he's like, not an out-and-out -out defensive player. He's not just a ball carrier. He's a bit of a jack-of-all-trades. But when he puts his head down, he really can power through some defenders. So good stuff from him. And then uh, my only all-black on the board is uh, is Ali Savia. There's not many times when you would see the all-blacks kind of manhandled like they were against the Irish, especially in that first half. But I still think Ali Savia looked better in that game than I thought he could play. Like, I know he's world-class. There's kind of all kinds of debates right now about, like, how many of the All Blacks guys would actually make a World 15. Well, Adi Savi is going to be right up there. I know Lucy's is especially competitive, but he's going to be in somebody's conversation for sure. Like, in an effort where the New Zealanders were really struggling to go forward against the ironclad Irish defense, that guy's always able, seemingly, to get over the advantage line, pretty much. Maybe there's a couple of carries where he gets driven backwards, but not many. Um, like his try kind of exemplifies that. He's able to um, he's able to kind of twist and uh, I don't know, just get the ball down when it doesn't look like he's got any rights to be able to get the ball down. He's the one guy who manages to break through. He's the one who gives Will Jordan that pass where Will Jordan just gashes through and manages to score kind of a length of the field try. I mean, defensively, nine from nine tackles. Offensively, five defenders beaten. 57 meters. I mean, he concedes a penalty, but 13 passes, 19 carries. Like, the guy was just, someone mentioned, like, carrying the team on his back. He was trying his best in a losing effort. I still feel like that guy managed to stand out. Saw interviews with him. He was uh, obviously pretty gutted, but, um, yeah, I still think he held his hand up pretty well uh and as i said a pretty a pretty shocking all blacks defeat i say shocking just by the uh, the struggles in the first half to just get anything going forward the irish were all over them um other lucy's as i mentioned like quaker smith came on and was phenomenal for the spring box he was getting turnovers and big carries josh van der Fleer, like i mentioned if you wanted the ultimate defensive seven this week or potentially last week as well you have to go with him. He gets a try as well, which is kind of like icing on the cake. Tommy Riffle was probably Wales's player of the series uh, in their tests against South Africa. Like all three games, I genuinely think he was class. Matt Fagerson against the uh, the Pumas was also very busy. He's also had one of his uh, kind of more outstanding series. But um, yeah, Lucy's were real competitive. So there you go. I've maybe been a bit tough on the Irish Ford pack. I only have one Irishman in there on in hindsight, but I just pick them. And uh, I do try to balance the teams out, but also go with the guys who are generally outstanding. So there you go. Uh, scrum half, I did go with an Irishman in Jamison Gibson Park. It was probably between him and maybe Nick White 
or um, Van Portfleet, to be honest. Uh, Bertrand O came on and had a decent shift for the Pumas as well. But, I mean, Jameson Gibson Park. Without him and that partnership with Sexton, it's hard to see the Irish game plan being as effective as it is. Eh? It's just, I always use the word relentless with their attack. It's just such quick ruck speed. Like, we'll have to do a video at some point about, like, the stats. And I don't have ruck speed stats. But it's definitely, like, when you look at possession, territory, all that kind of stuff, uh, none of the things are as important for the Irish attack, I think, as, as that ruck speed, eh? It is genuinely unbelievable. And Gibson Park is a huge part of that. When he's on form, the pack generally goes forward. So he's got 52 passes. Uh, four runs for four meters is not that flash. Like there were other halfbacks who certainly got more ball and hand stuff. Uh, seven kicks, again, keeping the team going forward. Eight from 11 tackles is the most of any halfback uh, this week. So, um, yeah, a pretty good shift. I think him and, uh, and this fella, Jonathan Sexton, they're a pretty mean team. They complement each other really well. It helps that they play rugby together at the same club. Um, that's kind of one of the things that sometimes I wish other teams or coaches would look at a bit more is uh, I'm not sure how much value they put in putting guys from the same team. Obviously, it's, it's a balancing act, right? Like Ireland have been criticized for playing too many Leinster guys, but I certainly think there's a bonus to it. He ticks over his thousandth, thousandth test point in his career, which is a massive thing in itself. Uh, he supplies the inside ball for Bundy Aki, who ends up setting up uh, Henshaw for that try. So that would be like a secondary assist, but you don't get a registered try assist for that one for, for Sexton. But it's his hand that sets it up. Uh, he kicks his, most of his goals, three conversions, a penalty goal. I mean, there's that one off the crossbar, and then not long later, Will Jordan charging back at him. And yeah, uh, how old is Will Jordan? Like 24? 24 year old Will Jordan is faster than 37 uh, year old Johnny Sexton. Kind of no surprises there. He couldn't catch him, but I mean, apparently he had one run for 16 meters, which is a heck of a return. Uh, beats a defender for one run. I'll have to go back and watch the tape to see if that's right, but if so, that's pretty good. Um, sometimes with halfbacks, like, um, you know, nines and tens, the stats don't really tell you that much of a story. 12 passes, six kicks. Ultimately, him and Gibson Park were pulling the strings for the Irish attack and uh, getting them some go forward, so... Uh, good reward for those guys. And 14 from 17 tackles. Johnny Sexton never shies away from the physical stuff up front. He's he's not one of those tens that you kind of have to hide. I think he's on record saying like he, he loves you know he loves getting in there. He loves that part of the game. So um, 14 from 17 tackles, certainly the most of any fly half this week. Concedes one penalty, but yeah, without that 19 combo, um, I don't think Ireland would have been as good as they were. And uh, on the other 10s, Marcus Smith probably had his best game, I think, in an England shirt this tour. Andre Pollard, likewise, was the best 10 performance from the three South African games this tour. Um, Carreras, if you were picking a 10 purely on stats, the fact that you've got like an outside back who plays 10 with those wheels of his, like that guy's lightning. So he certainly tore things up for Argentina, but um, sexed him for the more traditional stuff for mine. I mean, the Irish theme continues here. Goodness me, I may be making up for the lack of forwards. Uh, Bundy Aki, another guy getting some big old go forward ball. Like I mentioned, he sets up uh, the try assist for Henshaw with um, with the pass that he just received from Sexton. So it does well to draw his man and get the ball away. 12 runs for 44 meters is a pretty solid return uh, against the All Blacks defense. He was always seemingly getting a bit of go forward. Three defenders beaten speaks to that. Clean break speaks to that. Um, three passes, one of them's a try assist, as I mentioned. He wins a turnover. He makes eight tackles, but misses a few. I think it was like six. So that's the only aspect that I'll be like, uh, that's one that improvement would probably be needed. But overall, man, if you wanted a bit of go for a ball from uh, Ireland this week, Bundy Aki was certainly one of their kind of key key stroke weapons. 12 carries for a 12 is, uh, is quite a lot. Really busy. Uh, 13, I ended up having to chuck a Welshman in here who's been... Relatively quiet, games one and two, but George North, I think, had his best game of the tour for sure. He certainly saw a bit more ball than what we've seen. If you watch that game, he put a big fend on Cheslin Colby, and Cheslin Colby is no slack defender. It's kind of, I don't want to say comical, but there's a big size difference between George North and Colby, and you might think, of course, George North should be able to fend him off, but 
Cheslin Colby's got a habit of bringing down some pretty big units, but North managed to get away from him in that one. Uh, six runs for 33 metres against that South African defence is actually a really good return, and I would say that's definitely more metres than he had in every, well, the other two games put together. He has a clean break. He has two defenders beaten. One of them is going to be Colby. Three passes and offload. Defensively, 10 from 10 tackles and three turnovers. One doesn't concede a penalty. Like a proper, proper shift from George North. On a losing shift when the South African forwards were really kind of, um, you know, putting the pressure on. Um, I think he proved that he's still uh, one of the better players, whether he's in the outside backs or whether he's in the midfield. It wasn't that long ago, before he got that huge injury, that he was in the form of his life. So, fingers crossed he's getting back to that now. Um, other midfielders, obviously, I, I, the main name I wrote down was Henshaw. If it's not for, for North, i probably put Henshaw in. If you wanted to put Henshaw in, I wouldn't deny it to you. He was pretty good. But I wanted to get a Welshman in there as well. Um, and I do think North justifies it too. Uh, outside backs, I've got an Argentinian uh, in here, in Emiliano Boffelli. Kind of game winner. If you watch that game in the last moment of the game, it's more Boffelli that, uh, that scores the final try. Um, he manages to kind of avoid the the oncoming Blair Kinghorn, just halts his pace just enough to see Kinghorn go flying past and goes over for the try. He kicks the final conversion. He's the one who puts in the offload for Carreras to get the Pumas opening try, so he's got a hand in both the Pumas tries. 86% um, from the boot is more than we've seen him from uh, in recent weeks. Really uh, solid shift from him. I'm not sure how... Uh, his employers at Club Rugby will feel about him uh, doing as well as he did, but I thought he put in a pretty good shift. Four penalties, two conversions, a try and a try assist for a left winger. It's not a bad not a bad effort. Five runs, 20 metres, that's a good return. Uh, three passes and an offload, five from six tackles, one quick line out, just the one turnover conceded. But um, yeah, ultimately, he had those kind of clutch moments, didn't he? Goal kicking or tries or setting up tries. Not a bad one from Boffelli, who was... He's not my favorite Argentinian player. He's certainly right up there. Uh, I also wanted to sneak a wee wallaby in here for the right wing. And you could certainly do worse than Tom Wright this week. Man, he had wheels when he scored his try. He managed to avoid the oncoming uh, Tommy Freeman who was trying to scream across to um, to cover him. He plays that little one-two ball with, uh, with Nick White to go over his try. So pretty well taken. Um, he has 13 runs, which for a winger is phenomenal. 113 meters is also not a bad effort. Two clean breaks and five defenders beaten. Really, really dangerous. Now, it's his defense that sometimes lets him down. Three from four tackles. The one he missed is on Freddie Stewart. So it's a it's a try costing miss, although in a pretty tricky situation. Six passes and an offload. But um, yeah, Tom Wright and a losing ship for the Wallabies. An injury ravaged Wallabies side. Uh, genuinely looked pretty dangerous. I thought it's a shame that one try, as I said, was a was it uh, one missed tackle was a try scoring one for the uh, English. But there you go. And uh, speaking of the English, for fullback, I will chuck in Freddie Stewart, the uh, the bomb diffuser up in the air. That guy, he certainly beat Reese Hodge, who had been called in from the Australia A side in the air. Um, yeah, he, he he does that pretty well, doesn't he? He's a big man. I saw him interviewed after the game. Uh, and uh, yeah, he tends to tower over most of the people he's standing next to, doesn't he? He steps around Tom Wright for the try, as I mentioned, so he gets a try. He has 54 meters from seven runs, which ain't bad. Two defenders beaten, also not bad. Four passes, so decent involvements for a fullback. I mean, some fullbacks get really in there and um, play kind of second distributor, but he's more of a traditional fullback who chases the high balls. Three from three tackles, wins a turnover. What else could you want, man? He... Um, he did things pretty well. Other outside backs who you could have had in your team this week, there is an extensive, extensive list. Keenan, for sure, was very assured at the back, took his try well. For Ireland, Malia for the Pumas was also, I thought, pretty dangerous. Duan van der Merwe scored a couple of tries on that left wing for Scotland. Delhi looked pretty sharp, although he was kind of flattened by Ashman at one point. Uh, Will Jordan obviously had that one moment of absolute magic. Um, I think he was largely kind of kept quiet barring that well if i haven't been able to bring myself to go back and rewatch that game but he certainly took that one try well both the irish wingers i mean hansen didn't get that much ball in hand but he was chasing high balls all day 
um, passing the ball around. James Lowe with that big boot of his. And um, he sets up the Keenan try. I think it's Hanson, Ke- uh, Hanson Low Keenan, right? For that try. So the three of them involved. Corin Bede for the, the Wallabies. Freeman for England. Adams for Wales. And Lewis Rezamit. You could go on and on and on and on. But I had to pick. And I went with Boffelli. Try, try assist. Goal kicking right. Took his try really well on a day where the uh, the finishing against the English was pretty hard to come by. But um, yeah, there you go, folks. Team of the week. It is a shame that the July matches are done. They've been really enthralling series. We kind of get the northern and southern splits uh, in terms of the results. You had the the French going number one with their win, uh, two series win. Uh, their kind of third string side, if you can call it that. With all due respect, against Japan. You've had Pacific Nations Cup, which is concluded. It couldn't include those games because there's no individual match stats for them or player stats. Um, I forgot to mention the Chilean 10. Um, Fernandez, Rodrigo Fernandez. Goodness gracious me. Go back and watch that guy's highlights. He's unbelievable. In both games, he was like ball carrying, had an absolute moment of magic. So, um, yeah, folks, it's been a great time to be a rugby fan. It's a shame to see it conclude. We look forward to the rugby championship for those of us down here in the south and hopefully some of you guys uh, up north will be keeping an eye on it as well um but yeah cheers for coming along in july folks do let us know who else you'd have in your teams uh and um yeah i'll talk to you guys again soon see you later